everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on the benefits of a layered security approach. Today we are going to be discussing what breach defense looks like in the real world and how you can enable your security teams to be more efficient and productive. We're also going to take a look at how you can accelerate your security team's response times with an integrated security architecture. Organizations need deep visibility into where their users are trying to connect on the internet, and they need the ability to stop malicious behavior across their users' devices. In this session, we're going to take a closer look at how our web protection solution, Cisco Umbrella, and our endpoint protection, Cisco AMP, work together as your first line and last line of defense to help you prevent, detect, and respond to attacks before damage can be done. We have a super exciting session planned for all of you, and we're going to include a couple of live demos so you can see firsthand the types of tools that security teams can use to accelerate their response times to attacks. Next slide. My name is Nagisa Tamorian. I'm part of the Cisco Umbrella, um, part of the Cisco Umbrella product team. And today I will be co-hosting this webinar with my colleague, Sean Earhart, who is an advanced threat specialist. I'm super excited to have Sean with us today. We're gonna learn a lot from Sean. Sean, thank you for being here and I'll hand it over to you to kick us off um, by discussing how you define breach defense. Absolutely, thanks so much, Nagisa. This slide and where we start this presentation on breach defense often surprises people because they're looking for headlines. They're expecting that from security vendors. They're looking for, you know, statistics and things like that. And all of that is abstract. And today we're really going to zero in on the teams that have to execute security, have to deliver breach defense. And here you can imagine a large enterprise might look at this and say, oh, I have all these people and more in my security team. And a small organization might look at this and say, hey, we have two people in IT and they're multitasking. I don't have any of this, so maybe this presentation isn't for me. And I wanna make sure everybody understands how they're included. When it comes to breach defense, even if you have a small team, you've still got to execute all these jobs. So these are not titles of people, these are jobs that need to be done. So if you're a small team, the managers, the CISO, the security architect, and also lead security operations, and of course the admin does everything else, network, endpoint, email, web security, as well as incident response. So when it comes to breach defense, whether you're an enormous organization, whether you're a very, very small organization, you can all agree on a very simple definition. A breach is when an attacker gains access to devices or data. And if you're in IT security, you recognize that immediately as really the finish line for security. You know, if you're in IT security, you spend all your day trying to make sure that attackers don't gain access to devices or data. You're driving home, you're thinking, hey, did I deliver for my organization today? Did I do a great job today? If you prevented that from happening today, you win security, guess what? Your prize is you have to wake up tomorrow and do it again. But this, this definition of breach also includes all of those other stakeholders, even users, everybody in the organization who's acting on a day-to-day -day basis in a way to try and make sure that their decisions aren't going to allow an, an attacker to gain access to devices or data. So everybody can agree on this definition, but what about this de definition, breach defense? This is tougher, and when we sit with teams around the world and talk to them about breach defense, it's often fascinating to hear, even within teams, a disagreement of what breach defense really means, what it means to deliver that to your organization. And the number one thing that comes up, of course, everybody again can agree on this, breach defense equals blocking. And we're gonna talk about blocking today. We're gonna to talk about blocking in the two tools that we're focused on today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about blocking across the entire Cisco security portfolio. And Cisco has all the reports that are important, third party, all the proof that we need to show that we are 
as good or better than any other vendor when it comes to blocking. But when it comes to breach defense, we also recognize there's more to breach defense. And I'll start off showing you the other three things that are critical to breach defense by asking a simple question. If I were your CEO in your organization today, or I was a business partner, or I was on your board of directors, and I just asked you a very simple question, DNS espionage, are we okay? And what I want to know is, are we blocking DNS espionage? And what I'm asking you is, do you have any evidence that it's been inside our environment tried to execute? So those two, two sub-questions, are we blocking it? And it hasn't been inside our organization. My question to you is how long that would take you to answer with a high level of confidence. And I do this presentation across the world and it's fascinating to see the answers that I get from organizations large and small. Some organizations say, Sean, that would take me six hours or eight hours. And six hours is a pretty popular answer to get a high confidence uh, gut check on whether, uh, on if it's been inside our environment as well as if we're blocking it. But some organizations say, Sean, even if you gave me four days and my entire team worked on this, I couldn't give you a high confidence answer. We're not yet there with our security. So it's a huge challenge. We'll talk a little bit about how we overcome that with a free tool from Cisco that integrates your Cisco and non-Cisco tools. But if we dug into how you would react to that, it's really straightforward. All of these different teams would have to start answering the question. And I'll give you a great example of email security. So email is often uh, a little bit disconnected from the core IT security team because their focus is on keeping that email flowing as well as making sure it's secure. So Sometimes in organizations tell us, hey, we have to open a ticket with that team or they have to open a ticket with a different team. We have to wait. They have an SLA to respond. So it often is very, very challenging from a communication perspective, and that's an executive problem. How do we get faster in our communicating? But at the end of the day, if you have all these teams and all these consoles, guess what? You're going to have all sorts of opinions. So one console will say this, one console will say that, and you're going to have to put your reputation on the line by delivering one answer up to your organization, which is a huge challenge. And that brings us to this statistic, which is really impactful. When you're on the front lines, when you're an IT admin or a manager, or your job is to deliver security in your organization, whatever your function is, here's an example of a study that was done just a few years ago where they studied once a breach occurred, how long was it until the internal IT team could say to management and users and the public and customers, that breach has been contained? So the difference between when the breach was discovered and when it was contained. And the answer is an average of 66 days. So imagine the stress that an organization has to go through on day 12 and then day 14 and then day 24 and day 34, and you're still saying, not yet, we haven't contained this yet. And then it rolls down to day 44, day 46, and finally day 66, and you could say, hey, we've contained this. And this leads to a quote that I was told by a CIO just a few weeks ago where he said, Sean, I can survive one breach. I cannot survive two. So it's very, very stressful. So at Cisco, of course, we're very focused on how do we make it easier? How do we remove the stress of this process of trying to understand this? And if we go back to this question, DNS espionage, are we okay? Let's do our first demo and let's really dig into what it would take to actually understand that. So here what I've done is I've done what everybody starts with is I've Googled DNS espionage, that one threat. And here I've come to a Talos blog post. Talos is our security threat intelligence group here at Cisco. And I've done, I've done the work, the starting work. I've Googled it. And I'm just going to read this blog post. And this is a very, very in-depth blog post. It's got a bunch of screenshots. I've got to scroll through. I've got to understand all this stuff. You can hear me speaking fast and scrolling fast because I've got to get through this. I've got to get to the bottom. But think about how long it would take you to understand exactly what's going on in this particular threat. And then, of course, you probably have to read multiple blog posts. And now at the bottom, I've got these indications of compromise. So here's some stuff that I can actually use and take action on. I've got these file fingerprints. 
so I can go to my network tools and I can say, hey, have you seen this file across our firewall? Have you seen it across our web security, for example? I can take that to my endpoint tools and I can say, hey, is this file been inside my environment? And if I have pretty good tools, I can start to figure this stuff out. And then on the other side, of course, I've got these domains down here as well. So I can go to my network tools and I can say, hey, have we seen this domain? And that takes a tremendous amount of time and effort by security folks. And, it, and it, quite frankly, it's quite stressful because, again, your reputation is on the line, and you may not be familiar with all of the different consoles that you have and how to search them and how to identify that. And you're just trying to provide a very simple answer. Remember the answer we're trying to, uh, the question that we're trying to answer. Has this been inside our environment, and are we blocking it? And it comes as a very big surprise to non-Cisco customers that Cisco customers aren't doing any of that. Cisco customers aren't scrolling the web page. They're not reading the web page. They're not copying and pasting into Notepad. They're just clicking a button. And when I click the button, this is a browser extension. And what it's going to do is it's going to read the web page for me. It's going to scrape the information that it can use, and it's going to reach out to something called Cisco Threat Response. And Cisco Threat Response is a cloud console it doesn't contain any data. It just understands how to talk to your Cisco and non-Cisco tools, and it understands how to organize the answers. And this is just a way to start communicating with Cisco Threat Response. We're going to do a, a longer demo in a, in a little bit where you're actually going to see that console and understand. But when I show this to you, I, I've not clicked the button because I want to tell you the most important thing. This solution does not cost you anything extra. It's included in your Cisco security tools. This is something that people have a hard time, quite frankly, believing because when they see what this console does, they understand the, the, the depth of integration that we had to do and the depth of development that we had to do to deliver this. But if you own Umbrella, which we're going to talk about today, if you own it for endpoints, you get this console. And if you have other Cisco security tools, you get access to this console as well. So what I've done here is I've just pressed the button and it's reaching out to Cisco threat response in the cloud. I've got, it's found 16 observables on the page. So you can see some of the observables here. And it's found some things that we're blocking. And anything that's red is being blocked right now. So we have Cisco umbrella. And just for background, that's our DNS-based web security solution, cloud-based, protects our organization globally. And I can now know for sure that Cisco umbrella is blocking this domain. That's terrific. Now, here I have um, a file fingerprint, and we're going to talk about endpoints today, and that's our next generation endpoint security. Now, I know I have that deployed across my environment around the world, so I'm sure that our laptops, desktop servers are all blocking this file. Um, but it doesn't just connect with those tools that we talked about here today. It connects with all of my other Cisco and non-Cisco tools. So when it comes to firewall, email, I can also know that it's being blocked there. That's terrific. That's the red icons. Green icons means something that we have identified that is not a threat at this point. So we continue to test it, and I'll just tell you that snort.org is owned by Cisco. It's managed by Talos, and it just so happens to be in every blog post by Talos. So it's not a threat. It's not listed as one of the domains down here. So now we can come down here to this domain here, this rimrundomain.com. And I have this set up in my demo in order to do this, to show this. This would normally, of course, be blocked in a real threat situation. But it's gray here, which means that we haven't rendered a verdict. And if I want to take action on this, all I have to do is click block this domain. Now, what is going to happen when I do this? And I want you to, I want you to watch and really pay close attention because something's going to happen really quickly here. This little green, so we call it the toaster pops up, this little uh, message comes up, and that is umbrella answering my call. So what I've done is I've said to Cisco Threat Response, I want to block this domain, and the umbrella console has come back and said, I confirm I have that action and I'm executing it. So I don't have to audit that. I don't have to go and open a ticket. I don't even have to open up another console. And that is critical from an acceleration standpoint. And so now I can go to my senior executives and I can say, hey, you know what? We have identified that we are blocking this threat based on my, my, my initial uh, research, which I didn't even have to read the blog post. I just clicked the button. Uh, there was uh, one domain that was involved in this attack that wasn't being blocked, but we remedi remediated that. I didn't even have to open up a console to do that. 
And this is really critical when it comes to breach defense because customers always say, they say, you know, I've done, uh, in 13 years in security, I've done uh, just about 5,000 uh, customer presentations. And, you know, literally every one of them has, has contained this phrase, hey, Sean, what I really want is one console. And what I've just shown you is no console. So you can get a gut check your security. You can understand if you're blocking it without even opening anything up. Now, later, what we're going to do is we're going to select some observables and we're going to hit investigate. I'm going to show you the Cisco Threat Response Console so you can see how you can dig in and answer the second part of the question, which is, have, are we, uh, has it been inside our environment and take any action that is needed at that, at that point? So, now we're coming to the end. We've demonstrated that breach defense is more than blocking. We've demonstrated how important coordination is to all of these teams. And we want to give some variables that we can talk about today that we're going to show you how Cisco is maximizing in our customers. And the first one is time. And this is critical. And how do I know it's critical? I know it's critical because Cisco is going to do hundreds of security presentations around the world today. Other vendors are going to do hundreds as well, and almost every one of them is going to start in the same way. The customer is going to come in, and they're going to say, hey, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming. Let's begin. They're going to stop the presentation right to start and say, by the way, we have a small team, and we don't have any extra time. And it doesn't matter if it's going to be a large financial or huge governmental organization. Every security presentation includes that because people don't have enough time to deliver security in the way that they want. So we're going to show you today how we're recapturing time. If you don't have Cisco threat response, I already showed you how we can speed you up and take hours off your, uh, off your incident response time or even just that gut question of are we blocking it. So you can see we've already made a big splash here, and we're going to continue to, to maximize that variable for you. The second one is expertise. This is something that is a precious commodity for security teams. You're in the room, you're in the meeting, and you have to be the expert in security. Wow, is it tough when somebody says, hey, are we blocking this threat, just like we demonstrated DNS espionage? All of a sudden, you've got to be an expert on every threat and all of the latest techniques. That's difficult. And I just showed you a little sneak peek on how we're making you, uh, giving you that expertise at your fingertips or showing you how you don't even need to be an expert. We've cut out that step, that learning curve. We flattened it, made it easy for you. The second part of expertise, which is critical, is being an expert on all your tools. You know, security is really all about understanding what the capabilities of your individual tools and consoles are. And as you can see, especially with Cisco Threat Response, and as you're gonna see later in the way that we've integrated the back end of all these tools, we're eliminating that need for you to necessarily be an expert in all your tools. We're making you faster. And the last one is really straightforward, evidence. It either happened or it didn't. Evidence is binary. Again, it either happened or it didn't. And how many times in the day are you sitting there going, I think this, but I'm not quite sure. Maybe you're giving definitive answers, but you have personal doubt. We're showing you that things either happened or didn't in your environment. You're either blocking them or you're not. And we'll show you in a little bit how Cisco Threat Response can help you identify what's going on and take action immediately. So that's the equation we're working with Nagisa. I'll pass it back to you for our next section. Thanks, Sean. All right, so from here, let's talk about what organizations need when it comes to breach defense. Like, what are some of the top of mind requirements that organizations have when they're thinking about immediate improvement um, for their approach to breach defense. Um, so of course there's this desire to get ahead of threats. And a key point of getting ahead of threats is being able to um, have you know, a strong first line of defense so that you are blocking threats and stopping them at that very first initial point of inspection. And that's where something like um, DNS layer protection is very, very effective at reducing your overall um, volume of alerts. Organizations also need an integrated 
last line of defense. Um, so really this comes down to getting deep visibility into what your users are doing, um, regardless of, of where they are located, um, and having that ability to stop that malicious behavior across their devices, whether it's their laptops, their smartphones, or other devices. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we jump into the next part of our demo that Sean is going to lead us through, I wanna take a moment now to give you guys all um, some context on Cisco's integrated security architecture. Um, you know, when I spend time talking to our customers and, and partners, you know, this is often one of the main, um, you know, differentiators that I hear them talk about. And one of the main reasons they really, um, you know, appreciate the Cisco security portfolio is because of the fact that we have this integrated architecture and that the various components of the portfolio talk to one another and share intelligence across one another. So Cisco's approach to security is, you know, an integrated architecture. Um, that provides protection from attacks across multiple vectors and can extend protection for all office locations and users, even when those users are off of the corporate VPN. And what's great about our approach to security and, and our security solutions is that it's all backed by our unmatched threat intelligence from Cisco Talos. Um, and, our, and our unified architecture brings together these various key components of the security stack. So we have um, the web security with umbrella, so that's the DNS layer protection. We have email security as well as endpoint security with AMP for endpoints. And all of these Cisco security products work together to provide a connected security system. And, and as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> this is a major focus area and differentiator for Cisco in the design of our products. Um, you know, we really believe that security tools should work together um, to help you defend better and be able to respond to attacks faster. So you may ask, you know, what are the important elements shared across these three solution areas? Um, so first of all, the backbone of our security is Cisco Talos threat intelligence. You know, security controls are, are really only as effective as the quality of that threat intelligence that they take action upon. And with Talos, you know, our, our rich um, threat intelligence feeds across all of our um, Cisco security products. And what Talos does is it is it analyzes data across every threat vector, across all of those um, security products. And really what that does is it fuels a complete view of the global threat landscape because um, Talos is analyzing such a rich and diverse data set from so many different um, intelligence sources. So when you look at um, Talos's intelligence, on a daily basis, um, you know, we're really seeing more. And if you want to, to stop more, if you want to block more, you need to see more, you need to have more data. So on a daily basis, we are blocking 200 billion DNS requests. Um, we're, we're, excuse me, we're seeing 200 billion DNS requests, um, as well as 1.9 trillion email artifacts and more than a million malicious files. Um, so the breadth and depth of this data means that Talos stops more threats before they reach our customers. Um, in addition, when it comes to Talos, that threat intelligence is funneled into every product to drive a collective response, and this is done in real time, which is also awesome. Another key component um, of our security architecture is the automated, th automated threat sharing from um, Cisco AMP and um, the threat grid sandboxing. So these, these components are both integrated across web, email, and our endpoint security. 
in addition, all three of these components are able to check files against the AMP database, which adds more than 1 million malicious files on a daily basis. Um, so really, it's a massive source for checking the reputation of files that are seen across all three of these product areas that you see in the center of the screen. And with that AMP ecosystem, you can see a threat once and then block it everywhere across your network and across your security stack. And finally, I want to touch on threat response, which, um, you know, Sean introdu introduced us to earlier in the demonstration. Um, and what threat response addresses is really that struggle that our customers have around keeping up with alerts and needing to log into multiple dashboards to see the bigger picture and, um, you know, get some context on whether or not they're impacted by a particular type of attack and being able to block that threat um, after the fact and being able to respond to it effectively. So with threat response, what you're getting is faster, better incident investigation. So it really is the glue that ties together um, events and intelligence across our security stack and aggregates it with other third-party intelligence feeds all into a single place um, to help you be able to um, you know, significantly reduce the time and effort needed to remediate threats. So from here, what I'd like to do is take a, a closer look at both Umbrella and AMP, and then we'll continue with another um, live demonstration. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so when you look at your um, web protection and your endpoint protection today, um, even if you already have solutions in both of these areas, how are they working together to help your team? Um, so you wanna think about this, you know, attacks come from all angles and you need to be able to identify and stop the threats across all of these threat vectors and share intelligence and be able to correlate incidents across all of these areas. I mean, ideally you're not going into multiple tools to be able to answer simple questions like, are we um, you know, impacted by this particular type of threat? So if, for example, you identify something malicious on the endpoint, how is that information being shared with your um, web security? And how do you share intelligence across these various product areas without having to take, um, you know, manual steps? Um, this is what we're going to take a, a closer look at today. Next slide. All right, so now I want to give you all um, you know, some more information on um, Cisco Umbrella and the role that Cisco Umbrella plays when it comes to um, you know, DNS layer protection. So I mentioned earlier that when it comes to um, you know, having a first line of defense, Umbrella is the perfect solution. Um, it's really because we are um, you know, blocking threats at that earliest possible point. So every time um, a device goes to do a DNS lookup, um, we are inserting security into something that your organizations are already doing. So Cisco Umbrella provides that first line of defense against threats on the internet wherever users go. Um, it's delivered from the cloud, so it's really the easiest way to protect all of your users in minutes. When it comes to um, the intelligence component of Umbrella, you know, not only not only is our intelligence not only is our intelligence aggregated with Talos, we're also learning from over 200 billion DNS internet requests daily. And that's, you know, global and a very diverse set of data. So what we're able to do with that large, large database is we're able to map out a view of the Internet and we can uncover potential attacks before they launch. 
So when it comes to the visibility component of Umbrella, you know, we offer complete visibility into internet activity across all locations, devices, and users. And as I mentioned earlier, this is on and off the corporate network as well. Another great benefit of Umbrella is that we're able to block threats over all ports and protocols um, for the most comprehensive coverage. Um, so you can get that insight into which users may be targeted um, with all kinds of threats um, from ransomware to phishing to crypto mining and, and many other common um, threat types. So the last component here for Umbrella is protection. And that really comes down to that ability to proactively block requests to malicious de destinations before a connection is even established. So if one of your users wants to go to a particular domain that Umbrella has deemed malicious, we will stop that connection and route your user to a block page um, so that they are not connecting to that malicious domain. Um, in addition to DNS layer protection, Umbrella now integrates multiple security services into a single cloud platform. So we now unify um, full web proxy or secure web gateway, as well as cloud delivered firewall um, and CASB functionality into a single cloud platform. And the benefit of having this functionality in a single platform is that when it comes to protecting you know, multiple locations, branch offices, you're able to reduce that um, you know, time, money, and resources that were previously required for deployment and integration tasks of these security tools if they were to remain um, point products. So that wraps up our overview of Umbrella, and now I'll hand it over to Sean to tell us more about AMP. Thanks, Nagisa. AMP Endpoints is one of the most exciting solutions in the security space, and it's something that our, our customers and partners that are using it, they get Quite frankly, they get surprised at what it can do and how it's delivering better security, but also better security operations to their organizations. And the first surprise is really straightforward. Cisco has been in this space protecting endpoints since 2008. And that often is a surprise because if you haven't heard of Cisco AMP for endpoints, you might think, oh, this is something we created last year or the year before or even six months ago. But in fact, it's 2008, it's been over a decade now that we've been securing organizations around the world. Started as a startup in Calgary, as a company called Immunet, that was bought by Sourcefire. They took that technology, continued it on the endpoint and put it in their IPSs. And you might know that today as AMP, Cisco bought Sourcefire and took that technology and put it in everything. So anytime you mention AMP or somebody, or you might have AMP advanced model protection, as a component of one of your non-endpoint security tools, guess what? All of that technology started in endpoint way back when in 2008, and their breakthrough, think about what the, what the landscape was back then, their breakthrough was cloud delivery, endpoint security. And now we take that for granted, but really that was one of the first organizations way back when that, the first vendors that actually sold that cloud delivered endpoint security. And today, obviously, we block threats, and that's critical. We're going to talk about uh, all the really neat ways that we do that. We've already talked about how critical that is for breach defense. But we also offer you to do two key things that organizations struggle with. Know everything about every endpoint. And I'll actually demo that in a few minutes. That's a, a functionality called Orbital that allows you to understand exactly what's going on, ask literally any question of any endpoint, and get answers in seconds. Um, so you can be very, very confident that something is going on or not going on. Remember, we talked about that evidence, and that was critical. And then respond completely. Security that works together, we're going to talk about that today, how it works with Umbrella, how it works with other tools, and how if you own one of the other Cisco security tools out of the box without even making a connection between those tools, 
they are working together on the back end through Talos to improve your security. So adding AMPs for endpoints, we can show you how that delivers a jump in security, not just operations, but in efficacy immediately by joining that to any other Cisco uh, Cisco solution. Again, even if they don't even know that they're protecting the same organization, they help each other. That's critical. The last thing that I'll talk about here is something that's that's really a shining uh, part of this solution, and that is the ability to either replace your existing security or work alongside your existing endpoint security. So we protect thousands of organizations and millions of endpoints, but we do it in two ways. And it's the same license, you don't have to buy something different. You can either uh, deploy AMP for endpoints behind your existing security. So you might say to yourself, hey, I'm an umbrella customer. I'm a Cisco firewall customer, and I need the advantage of AMP for endpoints on my priority computers. Maybe that's 100 servers in your organization and 25 executive laptops, however you slice and dice and call computers priorities. You can deploy it for endpoints out there behind your existing endpoint security. Maybe that's McAfee or Symantec or some other tool. We happily coexist because we are built from the ground up to do that. We can also replace your endpoint security. So you might say, hey, my Symantec, my Cathy, my other vendor is up for renewal. I'm looking to move on from them. Or maybe there's an incident and they didn't deliver what you needed. We can absolutely replace them. And you can do it gradually too. You can start out with 50 connectors or 75 connectors or 100 connectors, and then you could grow over time, add more connectors or deploy fat, uh, further into your organization. And again, you can run in those two modes. So lots of opportunities here. And we're going to jump right here, and I'm going to show you a demo of Umbrella and AMP for Endpoints, and then we're going to bring the portfolio together to show you how on the back end the tools are working together and give you an example uh, of a real threat out in the wild today. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about more about how the solutions work together, and I'll do that final demo. All right, let's dig in and do some demos so we can show people the technology we've been talking about. And we're going to do a little bit of a different style of demo here. You know, a, a normal demo to do, to deliver the, the actual value and understanding of both of these technologies, you know, it would be at 30 minutes each minimum. And we're going to go really, really quickly. So I want you to know out there if you're watching these demos, we're not demoing all of the functionality of these different tools. We're just going to show you some really neat things on the uh, uh, for each tool, so you get a sense for what they are. And if you want more, you can talk to your partners, you can talk to Cisco, and we'll do customized demos, or you can see demos online as well. So you can see here, I'm in the Cisco Umbrella Console. And again, normally in a demo, I would scroll down and I would start talking about all the different things that we're doing. But I'm going to flip over to what we call Investigate. And Investigate allows me to show off the back end. Of the tool. So uh, if I type correctly. Uh, my domain that I'm looking for, and I've picked on this domain for years, disorderstatus.ru, I can query the back end of umbrella and really understand uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get a really good deep visibility of how that is seen by umbrella and obviously you can see it immediate right now command and control block list it's being blocked so that feels good that's great um, and then here i want to pause and, and give you a sense for this what we're looking at and the significance of what it is so it's pretty quite straightforward what it is it's the timeline of dns queries for this domain very straightforward so i can just tell because when you see enough of these you start to understand exactly what the patterns look like you can see it's very, very tall and then very small for two. That means these are the days of the week and this is the weekend and that's very straightforward. If you look at any social media, uh, Facebook's uh, Snapchat, it'll look very, very similar um, from a timeline perspective where it's very active in the, during the uh, week, work week and then it's smaller on the weekend. But you can start to understand when you plot these out like this, you can gain a lot of visibility and insight into domains when you're watching them over time like this and looking at the pattern of domain requests. So, for example, a blog post that uh, goes viral, you know, it's very flat for a long time and then spikes up. 
Well, guess what? That's slightly different than a, than a WordPress site that isn't very popular and then spikes up, but it's actually been compromised and it's malicious. There's a difference in the spike, and you can actually identify that, and you can be you're able to block that proactively. And if you're interested in the big data analytics, the algorithms that we use to, to uh, identify and get ahead of attackers, you can look at spike rank, which is one of the techniques that I just talked about, or you can ask uh, your Cisco or your partner seller to understand about IP space monitoring where we're seeing a domain that's malicious, we're tracking that back to the IP, scanning that IP space range with something like Nmap, for example, understanding the infrastructure that's delivering that malicious content, and then scanning for that fingerprint, getting ahead of attacks, being able to attack, block attacks before they're even launched against you, and that's a key critical component of Umbrella. I'm gonna scroll down here, and I'm gonna scroll back up in a second, but another thing that I'll talk about really quickly is co-occurrences. So, um, domains that are that uh, people go to either before or after this particular domain that I searched for. So again, getting insight into what other domains might be involved in this particular attack. And the last thing I'll talk about here, which we're going to come back to in a few minutes, is associated samples. So McGeeson talked about sandboxing, and that's with ThreatGrid, the cloud sandbox. Of, of course, it's available as appliances, but this is leveraging the cloud. And here's a particular sample that we've identified in ThreatGrid that has been linked back to this particular domain, disorderstatus.ru. And remember that this sample may not have come from uh, a search of the internet. Maybe this was delivered by email, or it was uploaded by endpoint, or firewall. And you can start to see the portfolio starting to link together weak signals and really understand how this attack is unfolding so that our tools and our customers can get ahead of that. And we're going to come back to that, but that's a very, very quick insight. A few really neat things about Umbrella that give you a sense for what it is. And if we talk and flip over to the other tool we're going to talk about today, Here's the console for, for endpoints, and I'm not going to dig into this console again. You can see there's tons of things that we're doing, and I'm not even going to talk at length about, about most of the key things about this solution. Just remember it can run behind their existing endpoint security, or it can replace it. I'm going to talk a little bit about something unique that we do in that we track 30 days of behavior of every single endpoint. So what does that mean to you? What that means to you is this this threat timeline is available to you at any point when you want to understand what happened on Frank's computer yesterday that caused this communication to uh, that was blocked or why why is this particular computer generating so many blocks you can understand that in seconds um, at scale this is really important because if you have a thousand computers think about that you know we're storing 30,000 days of data of your computers in the cloud available to you at any given time. But the real critical part is what we do with that data. So we're constantly churning through that data and trying to answer the question, based on the behavior of every single one of our customers' endpoints, have we delivered perfect security? Have we missed anything? We're analyzing these uh, this timeline to understand, for example, maybe we let in a file two seconds ago that was actually malicious. Nobody's clicked on it, it's not executing yet. But our threat research in Talos has identified that, that file is malicious. We can actually strategically block that file in any point around the world without having to issue a signature because based on the timeline, we know exactly where it is and we know exactly what it's done. So again, really, really critical that not only are you, do you have this available to you, but Cisco does as well. We'll talk uh, at the end for one quick second about this part of um, and for endpoints, and that is critical in that I just talked about the power of the cloud, but often people are, are, are of course, wanting to understand what about something when, when the computer is offline. And here we have exploit prevention from Cisco. So this is always on. It doesn't need to be connected to the cloud. I'm just showing you what it looks like in the timeline, and it essentially changes the way applications allocate memory. It, randomizes the way they allocate memory. So we're shifting the attack surface. So when on a, a process is tried to connect it to uh, uh, at, at runtime and memory is injected into, or sorry, there's a potential memory injection, that's stopped automatically. You don't need to have rules that are downloaded and updated based on the last, last threats. It's very elegant, it's very simple, and it stops those in-memory attacks that other tools 
can't stop because the only way you could see those is on the endpoint. So very, very elegant, very simple, big leap forward. Now, if we bring the tools together and show you a little bit about how you can, uh, how they're working for you, if we go and we talk about a particular threat, I'm on Talos and I've got this GAN crab, a ransomware blog post. And I'm not going to scroll down here. I'll just tell you if you wanted to understand this, you could Google it and really understand this threat exactly what it does. Um, what I've got here is I've actually um, ran that particular threat, a sample of that particular threat in the sandbox. And I'm just going to show you the behaviors of that. So again, you could start to see how those are executing if it was inside your environment and how the portfolio works together. So here, if you're familiar with sandboxing tools, you know exactly what this is. You've got a, blog, a definitively malicious file. You've got all the different behaviors. And we can see here, here's Cisco Umbrella. So Cisco Umbrella has identified this particular file as connect, trying to connect to a CNC server. And that's definitely a reason to block that. So if that's running on your endpoint, for example, well, that connection is blocked. But you want this actual file to be blocked on the endpoint not just the connection. And here we can start to scroll down and see some other behaviors that would be blocked. We just talked about exploit prevention. And here we've got potential code injection. So this is an example of a behavior that would definitively be blocked by endpoints exploit prevention. So now not only is the communication being blocked, which is critical, but the actual uh, behavior of the file, this is just one example of how this file would be blocked, is blocked so that the attack is stopped at multiple points in the attack chain. And I'll show you one other quick thing, and then we'll pass it back to finish up this, the presentation. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to abstract the method of attack from the payload. So here I've got this particular activity, process modified auto run registry key value. And I just want to know, is this executing anywhere else in my environment? So I know I have a win here. I blocked this particular threat, but I want to understand maybe there's a different payload. Maybe there's a different methodology that they're using trying to execute that. And what I just did was I clicked on a button that launches Orbital, which is part of AMP for Endpoints Advantage. And it allows you, as I said earlier, to, to understand answers to any question in your environment. And here we've automatically built a query. I'm going to just click All. That's going to query all my computers, and it's going to get me answers in seconds. And here I have the answer, no, that behavior hasn't happened on any endpoint in my environment. But you know what? I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to schedule a job, and for the next, say, 30 days, I'm going to run that again and again because I want to know this technique was tried against me. I want to know if that's happening in my environment. And again, that will just very lightweight query my endpoints and identify if that's happened. So again, you can start to see how we can pivot here and really understand what's going on. And if you're a small organization, you're probably pretty excited right now because I just gave you threat hunting in a box, easy, pre-built queries, and we have over 200 of these queries stored right here. You don't have to pivot from a threat. You can identify them here and just uh, run queries based on your own. You can customize them. And that makes that accessible. You could literally start today and start in five minutes. So with that, we've just shown you a couple of really quick demos, and we're going to switch back to the rest of the presentation. All right. Thanks, Sean. Okay. So as we wrap up, we're going to do one more quick um, threat response demo. And to tee us up for that, I want to talk about the benefits of security that works together. So when you have security that works together, that enables you to see more to block more, to react faster because you have all of the information you need in one place and that can really help you detect and investigate faster so that you're ultimately um, shortening your response times. It also helps you to respond completely and also to automate um, so that you um, are freeing up as much time of your resources, valuable time, so that they can focus on other tasks that are important to your organization. With that, I'll hand it back over to Sean one more time to give us a, a quick demo of threat response. Thanks so much. 
and we are going to go back to where we really started here. If you remember at the beginning of our presentation, we did this question about DNSB NOS and how long it would take you to identify if it was blocked or if it's been executing or tried to execute inside your environment. And remember, we left off by pressing that simple button that Cisco customers are pressing today to find the observables on the page, identify the dispositions, understand what's being blocked and what's not being blocked. And what I said was, I'm going to select some of those and I'm going to investigate them with Cisco Threat Response. And I'm going to click this button and launch Cisco Threat Response. We're going to come back to exactly where we started from a demo perspective. Remember, we were on this blog post and we were trying to answer the question about DNS espionage. Is it being blocked in our environment? And is there any evidence that it has been inside our environment? And if you remember where we left off, it was really straightforward. We had identified where it was being blocked and where it wasn't, and we took action. And I said, hey, we're going to go and do an investigation of this so that you can see the power of Cisco's tools working together to accelerate your breach defense and your incident response. And that's what we're going to do right now. I'm just going to push this button for, that's, that launches the investigation. And when I do that, we are going to jump into Cisco threat response. And here, what you're seeing is the Cisco threat response console. And to orient to you, it's really straightforward. And again, I'm not going to do a huge demo here. Just understand that you can easily set this up by clicking modules and have it talk to your Cisco and non-Cisco tools. All the technology, all the work has been done to make that very seamless. And you can see here that I've got my observables here that I've scraped off that page. Cisco threat response has gone and understood exactly what it can learn inside my environment about these particular observables. And it's done that by reaching into the history of my environment. So AMP for endpoints has, as we said, 30 days of history of every single endpoint. Umbrella has 30 days of history of your DNS request and your web security. Firewall, email, all those other tools have history. So let's use that. And we've done that here. And you can see here we've got some disconnected, some loose items. And these are things that Cisco Threat Response can tell us more about, but that are not necessarily inside our environment. And anything with a magnifying glass is something that I sent to Cisco Threat Response just a few seconds ago. And any of these icons without a magnifying glass are something that uh, Cisco Threat Response has found on its own. So you can see here, we have things over here with arrows, and this is where I'm concerned because this is saying, hey, there is evidence that it's been inside our environment. So here, for example, you can see a domain that's been blocked, and that's terrific, and that's, I've got a magnifying glass, so I submitted it, but I've got a file here that's gray. So you might be wondering, where did this file come from? Well, guess what? When Cisco Threat Response reaches out to your tool, it actually enriches the information that it gives and does the work of the security incident responder, or the, at least does the start of their work, to try and link to and understand, well, I've got this information. What other information is it linked to? So this is a file, for example, that came from AMP for Endpoints 30-day history that's somehow linked to this attack. Here's a domain coming from Umbrella in the same way, saying it's a link to this attack. And you can see it's red and this one's gray. This one's already being blocked. This one isn't. We'll come back to this in a second. But I want to answer the question, how many computers were impacted? And I can see here under targets that I've got one computer. So that's definitely impacted. I need to worry about that. And now if I go down, I can say, you know what I really want to do is I want to isolate that computer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just click here and I'm going to isolate that computer. And somebody's already been in this demo and stopped it, but I'll start it again. Now I'm reaching out to endpoints and essentially freezing that computer. So it can't talk to any of my other computers and I'm now safe for whatever attack is, might be running on that uh, particular computer. And in this case, we have AMP for endpoints uh, running in, in silent mode. So it's not really blocking anything on that computer. So we can show you some stuff. Um, and now I've got that quarantined. It's isolated. It's only talking at this point to Cisco Threat Response and for Endpoint, so I'm good there. I have this file that's malicious. I want to block that, so I'm going to block that, and I'm going to block it not only on my endpoints with just one click. I'm going to block it everywhere else in my environment, email and firewall, again, one click. So that's very, very straightforward. But I want to understand exactly how that file came into my environment, so I'm going to add that to my investigation. And now what I'm doing is I'm asking Cisco Threat Response to I come back and say, hey, 
where else, or how, how did that get inside my environment? And it's going out and giving that particular, that new piece of evidence, remember this doesn't have a magnifying glass, so it's new, it wasn't analyzed by all my different tools, and it's asking them, hey, where, where did this, have you seen this in our environment? Try and answer that question again. How did it get in? And that's gonna take a few moments, and I'll just scroll down here to show you something very, very quick. Again, this is feed information coming from Umbrella. This is coming from Amper Endpoints, other tools. I can now tell at a glance how this, what the timeline is of this attack in my environment as well as globally. So I can understand if that attack is uh, something that has been live everywhere all around the world for months or if it's a targeted attack against me. So now I can see all of these icons popping up. And again, I don't even have to be a security PhD to understand, you know what, that came in through email. I can see all the at symbols and I can check my targets down here and I can see this email address. So now I've answered that final question, how did it get in, it came in through email, and again, I can take action. So you can see how Cisco Threat Response brings the portfolio together. We said they were connected on the back end. We showed you how they were working in the back end. This allows you to see exactly the power of it and how you can take action and uh, leverage the architecture to improve your security. All right, a friendly reminder for all of you that this is an interactive session, so feel free to post your questions in the chat, and Sean and I will um, address a few of them live as we wrap up here. As a thank you for attending our webinar today, we would like to extend for all of you free trials for both Umbrella and AMP. These are 14-day trials, and we highly encourage you to take advantage of this great of this great offer and um, you know get started with using both of these products um, so for umbrella super simple to get started it's just three easy steps all you need to do is sign up and register your network then next you will update your dns forwarders to point traffic to our umbrella resolvers and that's it from there you're ready to go and umbrella is now in action um, and we'll be able to start seeing your requests in real time and block malicious threats um, and give you visibility and control across your network. Sean, can you tell us a bit about the AMP free trial? Absolutely, and just think speed, folks, when it comes to AMP for endpoints because people normally think to themselves, hey, um, I, don't want to test endpoint security because it's gonna be a forklift, I have to remove my existing security. It's so simple to test AMP for endpoints. You simply deploy AMP for endpoints on test computers up to 50 in your environment, and you can do it so quickly, immediately right behind your existing security. It'll work with your existing endpoint security. It'll show you what you're missing. Very, very straightforward. My personal record is to have my first connector downloading, ready to install in 58 seconds. So really, really fast. And then the other thing is, we showed you threat hunting today. You can start threat hunting in less than five minutes, and it's really, really straightforward. Just run your built-in queries and really get a sense for what your tools are missing today. Um, so very, very quick, Nagisa, very easy to set up and very impactful. It gives you a lot of data in the console so you can show your executives exactly why you want to move forward with the tool. Back to you. Perfect. Next slide, please. If you guys are interested in learning more about breach defense, you can go to cisco.com slash go slash breach, breach dash defense, and we'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat now. Next slide. Perfect. So now we'll open it up for live questions, and thank you to all of you who have dropped questions um, in the chat throughout the webinar. So the first question is, how can Umbrella be purchased? Um, so Umbrella is a SaaS service and it's licensed on the number of users. Um, we have a number of different package options available and um, to check out the packages and determine what may be best for your needs, you can go to umbrella.cisco.com to check out those options. Next question, Sean mentioned that threat hunting is easy to get started with. 
What are the steps? Sean, can you chime in on this? Yeah, absolutely, Nagisa, and, and that's a great question. Threat hunting is something that if you're doing it today, you find it quite challenging to get really good answers. And if you're not doing it today, sometimes it can be intimidating because you think you need to be a security expert. We have over 200 built-in queries you can use today. So as soon as you download a single connector onto one of your endpoints, you can literally start firing off those, those uh, queries and really getting uh, the, your threat hunting program started. You can do it, I say, in less than five minutes, but it's literally in just a few clicks you could start it off. And then the other thing that we do, because we include Threat Grid Console, which we showed today, that back-end view into the sandbox with your existing, with, with your endpoint subscription, what you can do is you can pivot and use those pre-built queries to understand and, threat and, and hunt exactly those threats that are being, uh, tried to be used against you. So really, really easy, very straightforward, one-two punch, and, and no joke, you can get started in minutes uh, and start delivering a very comprehensive threat hunting uh, program for your organization. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate you answering that question and thank you for being my co-host today. That's all we have time for in terms of questions. I want to thank you all for attending our webinar today and we hope that you learned a lot about the benefits of layered security and that we gave you some ideas for how you can go about accelerating response times for your security teams. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.